There is only one truth. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. One year ago I posted a video about the results of my research on the ethnicity of the ancient Egyptians. A fellow content creator, Quelimika, who disagreed with my take, responded to said video. A year later I responded once again. After this exchange, the channel Mr. Rimotep made his own response video to me, then Quelimika responded again. In the meantime, the channel The King's Monologue and a number of smaller channels had also been putting out content about me on this matter. I've just finished watching and listening to every major video response to me, including all live streaming from these channels. It's over seven hours of content. Every single minute, hour, sentence and word spoken has been carefully examined, statements categorized, points sorted in appropriate folders to facilitate the making of this meticulous video. I show it so that this time they'll believe me when I say that I watched everything. Not hyperbole. I felt like an FBI agent in those rooms with the headsets you see in the movies. As we always do on this channel, we'll now advance this argument through dedicated thematic chapters. Do I have a problem with the fact that so many channels have made response videos to me? No, criticism is a defining feature of any academic pursuit. Happy to engage. With that being said, among other things, I'm about to respond to a series of specific accusations directed to me and I will demonstrate these to be unfounded with such a level of certainty that if at any point you believed any of these, you'll see the truth again. But before I do that, I know you noble ones support me and your blood will boil when you'll hear some of the things these creators said and as a result, some of you will have an aggressive response. Remember that I don't condone any form of harassment. Understand that some of these accusations, even though they are demonstrably wrong, they do not come from a vacuum and I would be unfair if I didn't take at least partial responsibility in causing some of these accusations to happen due to the way I structured my original video response. Transparency, honesty and honour above all so I have to say that. Do not go to these channels to attack them. Every time the most militant of my detractors come here to insult me and attack me, I screenshot those comments and then use them against them. So don't give them this ammo against me. If you want, just go and share your opinion, but do it in a civil manner. That will show that we are a community that responds to attacks with civility. I will today double down and stand up to defend those points that I believe were valid, but I will also admit fault when fault is on my side. Since doing so will encourage critical thinking and logical discussions. At the end of the day, the purpose of this video is not to win a debate, but to find the truth. On my original video response, I classified Quilimica as an Afrocentrist and I described this channel as being focused on Afrocentricity. This statement generated the following response. So already, as the video starts, Metatron does something that I think is quite damaging to the debate, and that is stating that my channel is devoted to Afrocentricity. Try and throw a label on what you do, and that's one of the quickest and easiest ways you can discredit someone's argument. You don't have the right to place that term on me. So I just find it very, very annoying. Exactly. Like, why are you throwing me in a box when I actually never said it on my channel that I just know how it sells to people, like what they perceive when they hear Afrocentric. It discredits you, but I know what it means, but it doesn't mean that others... I honestly use the term Afrocentricity and Afrocentric because I believed it was the correct nomenclature and that it was describing your channels correctly. And considering this sort of titles used by, for instance, The King's Monologue, I'm not sure I can be 100% blamed for this. However, I'll have to admit that The King's Monologue brought up a very good point when he said this. But at the same time, I also know what you're trying to do. You're trying to undermine me. So I'm like, yeah don't don't call me that because you're just using it as a way of undermining my arguments that was not my intention but i do understand where they are coming from we need to give them that how people will have a preconceived negative idea of whatever point they'll make just based on the term alone without even dignifying the points they raise with a mindset free analytical approach so as a gesture i've updated the title of my previous response from this to this and i've also edited out the part where i said that his channel was focused on afrocentricity the change is now current to show you that i'm acting in good faith on this video will refrain from collectively addressing you as afrocentrists i would of course appreciate if you could avoid using the term eurocentric in a way to try and make me look bad since i never use that term to classify myself if anything if i get a choice i'm truth centric 
part of me now thinks that he yeah. just googled these names <laughs> sorry this led me to question both the competence of these linguists and even their existence since it has been suggested that the team that i mentioned at the very beginning of my original response video doesn't exist you're not my imaginary friends right i, I exist, exist. As you will have undoubtedly noticed, three of the four members of the team have now appeared on camera. The anthropologist hasn't. That is because first, she's not comfortable appearing on camera. Not only because she's camera shy, but also due to the toxicity of some of the attacks in the comments that my team and myself have received. And we need to respect that. What we did today, we didn't have to do. He's pretended that he's got this huge team of scholars that neither Quelimika nor Mr. Rimotep ever show their faces. But if anyone is gonna try and say that the anthropologist doesn't exist, I'll be happy to swear in front of a court of law. I would like to now thank the members of my team that have showed their face today. That takes courage considering the kind of attacks that I get online, but we are here for the world to see and we have nothing to hide. The number of times you guys use this term is concerning to me. So he's quite with. clearly lying here, which is... Metatron is simply spreading lies. But that's a lie. Metatron lied to you. It appears that for you, a disagreement equals a lie. But that's not what a lie is. I can disagree with you academically. I can think differently from you. And that wouldn't involve a lie. To be a lie, the intent needs to be to deceive. And is this a pattern? You bet. Everyone is a liar, from creators to academics to an entire continent. And talking about possible lies. When he did his video on the Nordic Romans, Mr. Imhotep had criticized him on the fact that uh, he was doing videos just attacking these topics. And he, he saw that, you know, him jumping on only when a movie, so when a character is turned black or anything, would look bad on him. So he did that video to balance things out, I think. That's my opinion. That's how I saw it. But anyway, I could be wrong. Just to make sure the accusation is clear, Mr. Rimote posts his response, I see it, and as a way to try and do some damage control, I create this video. So that sounds plausible. In fact, King's monologue believes it right away, and so does the audience during the live stream. Except that Mr. Rimotep's response video to me was published on the 12th of November 2023, while my video on the theory of ancient Romans not being Nordic was published on the 10th of November 2023. So the sole hypothetical argument that you made and everyone accepted just to make me look unfair is physically impossible. And to anyone watching, don't believe me. Just go check under the video description of every single one of these videos and you'll see that data of publication is a publicly available information. Wouldn't that give me space to now call you, Quelimika, a liar? And yet I don't. Why? Because of something called plausible deniability. I don't know if you did check and you knew it and you still said that, which would be a lie, or if maybe you didn't check and you just hypothesized without doing the due diligence. Still, checking during the live stream would have been the right thing to do instead of leaving it there for people to just believe and believe you, they did. He delves deeply into specific topics when it aligns with his agenda, but when faced with information that contradicts his viewpoint, he remains superficial and avoids the truth. See, the problem with this, Mr. Remotep, is that you're incorrect. I do have an entirely dedicated video to the idea of white marble in ancient Rome and how the statues were painted, and I thoroughly debunk this idea that the uh, all white marble were a representation of the fact that all the Romans were white. I do have a video about that. Once again, to the audience, don't believe me. Link to this video in the description. Check it for yourself. Should I call you a liar now? Plausible deniability. I still give you the benefit of the doubt. But maybe next time, before you state something like this, specifically designed to make me look bad, double check. And for fairness, I have to tell myself that too, because when I mentioned the idea that I thought perhaps the fact that Quilimika created his symbol just to put Africa on top of Europe, I was wrong. I read anti-European sentiment in that action, whereas what he was doing was just to represent the ancient worldview whereby, from the position of the Egyptians, the north was south and the south was north. So I was wrong about that, and I admit it. Will you? This part that I'm going to discuss now, even though it may seem marginal, in reality is 
critical for us to be able to continue this discussion. And at the end of this section, you will see that in fact, even though we disagree on a few fundamental things, when it comes to this word and what it means, my position has been misrepresented. This is a great moment to introduce another point of contention, which is the idea of olive skin and the massive misunderstanding that we have here because it seems like we're using and interpreting this word in completely different ways and I think we need to clear this one up before we can jump into evidence, iconography, passages and research. And I won't use the Photoshop color picker this time, you are right, that was not scientific of me, a valid point of critique. <laughs> a majority of the ancient Egyptians would have had olive skin. Now, this is pretty loaded, isn't it? <laughs> what you're doing is you're making an assumption about skin color. Most of them would have been olive skinned and then he pointed to his own skin, yeah? Olives are black and brown, yeah? Mr. Imhotep also said that I believe that the ancient Egyptians were olive skinned and tanned like me. While Metatron says that Asiatics were the majority of the population and that they were olive skinned and tanned like him, olive skinned and tanned like him. Yeah, they would have been colored like him and modern Egyptians. Guys, I'm white. I don't consider myself to be tanned. I don't consider myself to be olive skinned. Most of them would have been olive skinned and then he pointed to his own skin, yeah? Also, let's go to the video frame by frame and see if I really do point at my skin when I say the word olive, like the King's monologue stated. The majority of ancient Egyptians would have had an olive skin. And then he pointed to his own skin, yeah? I never do. You can check it for yourselves. Still, when we say that someone is olive skin, it doesn't mean that we expect that person to have the exact same color of an olive, which is your rebuttal, and by extension, what your audience is telling me now in the comments. To understand why the word olive is absolutely fine to indicate skin color, we need to discuss the concept of dynamics of color perception in communication systems, which is a fascinating topic. I'll leave a link in the description. Olive skinned like me, what is tanned, what is tanned olive skinned anyway, mate? Honestly, what is tanned olive skin? Olive? used to mean olive okay used to be an olive okay and if you're olive skinned this is what it used to mean the way you seem to expect people to use color terms is what in linguistics is called utilitarian but the way we interact with the color world in our language systems is not just utilitarian and i can prove this with a very brief analysis of lexical conceptual structures in languages both ancient and modern difficult words let me explain. Generally speaking, color terms in languages are used for two specific purposes, description and categorization. Now within the aspect of categorization, there is a linguistic phenomenon called type modification, which is very common in all sorts of languages, including the languages you speak, as I'll demonstrate in a second. What color would you say is the yolk of an egg? Well, from the dialectical names for yolk collected in the 1980s for Atlas Linguarum Europae, there is a variation in this answer, depending on the language in question, some say yellow, some red, some even shades of brown. And this is diachronic in nature, which means that there is a change through time. And even in English, the language you're using, white, this is white wine, this is yellow mate. Now imagine if I opened a bottle of white wine and instead of looking like this, it looked like this. There is nothing wrong with saying that a person has olive skin and the fact that you make fun of it kind of gives me the idea that then to you, the glass on the left would be white wine. Even in Old Norse, they described high quality gold and the sun as being red. And this happens in Slavic languages and Old Germanic languages. But what's pertinent in this case is the fact that sometimes the Norse describe things that we would normally describe as being black as blue. And this happens, for example, when they describe ravens in literature and it's not a matter of structural coloration, if that's what you're going with. and black Africans. The Norse called your people blue, but that's not because they actually saw them blue. It's because the word blue in Old North had a under meaning of mysterious, exotic. Having responded to all of these comments, I'd like to underline now what I mean precisely when I say that to me the ancient Egyptians were olive skin when it comes to the majority. If we look at the Fitzpatrick scale, which was created to estimate the response of different types of skin to ultraviolet light, you can see that when I say olive, I'm talking about a range of colors. So when you show me a dark brown Egyptian, it fits, and you're not debunking my statement in doing so. A dark brown skin is still included in what we describe as olive. Let's compare it to the older von Lushan's chromatic scale for more examples. I think it's apt because it's a spectrum and therefore allows for readjusting based on the evidence. Now, of course, the same can be said about the word black. It's also a spectrum and many different varieties of skin tone. But the reason why I tend to prefer the word olive is because it includes both people from the Near East 
and people of African descent. They can both have an olive skin, so I'm not limiting ethnicities. And since I believe in a multi-ethnic Egypt, to me it fits. But whether you agree with that statement or not, what's key about all of this is that by saying olive, I do not mean white. And I certainly do not mean that the ancient Egyptians looked like me. If anything, I'm probably type 2, so number 7 on this scale. What do you think? He implies that ancient Egyptians looked like him and other Mediterranean groups, which is false. So, you still want to attack and reject this nomenclature? That's fine. But don't attach to me the idea that the ancient Egyptians looked like me because I never did say that. I only said it about Cleopatra VII because she was Greek, so it was plausible. They have pale skin, basically. You're making the argument they have pale, creamy coloured skin. Does it mean that I believe the ancient Egyptians were white? No. Can you see it? The blatant misalignment between the speaker of the strawman and the target of the strawman? How's that fair? And due to this misrepresentation of my original point, I keep getting comments from his subscribers that tell me the ancient Egyptians were not white, stop lying! And this idea that I somehow believe that ancient Egypt was white is also pushed by the king's monologue. When I say they are mixed or multi-ethnic, I mean that they are a mix of olive and black. And the white inclusions came later, see Ptolemy and Rome. So I consider valid all your attacks against a multi-ethnic Egypt, I'll address them of course, because that is my point. And since you disagree with that take, it is your right to attack it. But I do not consider pertinent your attacks against a white ancient Egypt aimed at me, since that was never my point to begin with. Metatron is preparing you through character assassination to discredit Quilimica and build your sympathy for himself. So Mr. Rimotep says that my original video response to Quilimica is a character assassination attempt. Now that's a bit much, but I do understand where he's coming from. And the fact that he stood up to defend a friend, I can respect that. With that being said, since we are talking about character assassinations, well, the character assassination you tried to pull on me makes my original video response to Quilimica look like I'm in love with the guy. Now we're about to get into a very strong section of this video, and some of you will get really pissed when you see the sort of accusations that Mr. Rimot have launched against me, which is why before doing that I want to be fair and show you this. On the video where I publicly announced the fact that my mum was diagnosed with stage 3 cancer, Mr. Rimotep left this comment. Now, I dislike the way he built his video response to me, but this shows a man who at least has a baseline of decency. And he also wrote this as a pinned comment on his video encouraging his own audience not to attack me. So I am being fair in showing the good and the bad, and I didn't have to do this. Also considering the fact that you accused me of having attacked Quelimica and then systematically removed and not show your audience every single clip where I said this. And he doesn't call me a racist, so Quelimica, I commend you for that. I would like to begin by saying that this is not a direct attack to him, so I encourage my subscribers to not retaliate to that. Skin tone does not matter. Because that wouldn't have helped you in trying to represent me as the attacker. I don't think that was fair. Because it is a very known technique to manipulate people. In this section, Metatron employs another manipulation tactic that supports my previous assertions. The main problem is that Metatron manipulated us all over this video. I will show you every single manipulation tactic he uses and how at the end people are completely swayed by his apparent likability. Mr. Rimotep, you accuse me of being a manipulator who is employing alleged manipulation tactics to garner the favor of his audience against and at the expenses of Quelimica. And yet on your video, when you play my clips, you place ominous music when I speak, add a dark evil looking filter, you add disturbing noises in the background. My point. Ancient Egypt was a multicultural and multi-ethnic civilization due to its geolocation connecting the Middle East, Africa, Asia and Europe. A strategic location on the crossroad of continents, flourishing around the Nile River, which was a cultural conduit of civilization. Therefore, and get this, you changed the pitch of my voice. I never did that to Quelimica. Beginning with the systematic analysis of lexical resources and lexicosyntactic features of text, we move through a systemic function data analysis of genre and text metafunction. Beginning with the systematic analysis of lexical resources and lexicosyntactic features of text, we move through a systemic function data analysis of genre and text metafunction. Concurrently, when dealing with or using ancient Greek or even classical Latin vocabulary, you do not deal with absolutes. This is an absolute here. 
Concurrently, when dealing with or using ancient Greek, or even classical Latin vocabulary, you do not deal with absolutes. This is an absolute here. What this looks to me is a psychological operation designed to target and cause unconscious responses in the audience to control them against me, so that even my valid points would look dishonest and untrustworthy. And what do I base this on? Well, there are several empirical studies on sensor integration and pitch manipulation techniques and their influence on social judgments. Link in the description. It has been studied and demonstrated that changes in pitch, specifically raising one's pitch, produce negative results in the perception of speakers by the audience, specifically in matters of honesty and trust. So what am I gonna do now? Call you a manipulator? Because it surely looks like you know what you're doing. Cognitive restructuring. And yet, I will give you the benefit of the doubt because of plausible deniability, which you never gave me. So, you have heard Metatron's point in his own words, something I did not get the courtesy of in his video. Anyhow. Representing your opponent's point correctly during a debate is indeed crucial, because if you misrepresent your opposition's points, then what you end up doing is creating a straw man and attacking that instead. So they are absolutely correct and it's a valid point of criticism when they say that instead of me summarizing Kualimika's point during my response video, I should have let Kualimika describe his own point by playing his own clips. This in order to contribute to a more fine-grained understanding of the way arguments are perceived, processed and evaluated by the audience. So I apologize for that. With that being said, I don't think that every single point of critique that has been raised against me is indeed valid. To see what I'm talking about, I'd like to now play a section of Mr. Imhotep's video that I think could be revealing. Watch this. YouTuber Metatron released a video. The video did great as it immediately went viral. It provided hope to supporters of theories suggesting Mediterranean and Middle Eastern origins for the ancient Egyptian civilization. You will notice that this is constantly brought up in all response videos to me. They all say Metatron states that ancient Egypt was a Mediterranean civilization, and then they proceed to make lengthy sections of their videos debunking the claim that ancient Egypt was a Mediterranean civilization, presenting data to prove instead that ancient Egypt was an African civilization. This is a monumental strawman the size of a pyramid. I never said ancient Egypt was a Mediterranean civilization. Never. What I say is this. The ancient Egyptians were a multi-ethnic African civilization. African civilization. African civilization. So we fundamentally agree with the fact that ancient Egypt was an African civilization in the sense that it emerged in Africa and African people played a pivotal role. What we disagree on is the part where you say that 99% of ancient Egyptians were black, the people who are not black are fake Egyptians, and that all pharaohs were black. I disagree with that because I also think that it being a multi-ethnic civilization, which is my point, people from the Near East, the Levant, also played a pivotal role throughout its history. That's what we disagree on, but I never said it's a Mediterranean civilization. Rome is a Mediterranean civilization. Greece is a Mediterranean civilization, not Egypt. So where does this misunderstanding come from? From this section, as we can see on the video made by Know Thyself. Egypt faces the Mediterranean. I am Mediterranean. My sea, my history too. Ancient Egypt was by definition a Nile Valley civilization. Proceeding, know thyself, will go into a lengthy explanation of why ancient Egypt wasn't a Mediterranean civilization and instead was an African civilization. And to be honest, he does a good job in that section. So I'm not saying that that section is invalid. I'm saying that it's based on a misrepresentation of my point, which is also what every single other video that responded and talked about this did. They all took this statement of mine about being Mediterranean and used it out of context to create a Strawman. I'm not saying they did it on purpose, I can't prove that, but let me show you what that statement meant. That statement comes from the section where I talk about the fact that Quelimika uses the expression our history to talk about ancient Egypt and African history in general, which to me is a red flag and I still stand for that. And then I connect it to the fact that Quelimika's subscribers in my comment section say stop talking about our history, talk about your history instead, stick to Europe. And it was very clear that it was a response to that because 
I say that? And to that I respond, well, I'm from the Mediterranean, ancient Egypt faces the Mediterranean, my history too. It was my way to say that these people do not have the right to tell me that I cannot speak about African history because it's their history, it's all our history because we are all humans as I explain on this dedicated video. That was my point and it was twisted. My goal is to defend objective reality. Your goal seems to want to rectify the current understanding of African history and culture. He then presents himself as a defender of objective reality, accusing us to rectify the current understanding of African history. Apparently we are twisting facts. Rectify. Accusing you of rectifying. I use the word rectify to put myself in your shoes. Rectify means to make right again. Rebranding Africa, isn't that what you're trying to do? So what you're doing in reality here is that you are taking something that honestly was not an accusation and you're twisting it. I am saying the word rectify, but you're treating it as if I said the words twist, rewrite or distort history. I never said that, I used the correct word. So that's not on me. Usually he loves to complicate things, using big words, to make his claims sound more important than they actually are. Any point of agreement will have to be ontological, <laughs> factual, and documented. This is a point where I'm going to jump in now. This is Metatron 101, and this is one okay. of the reasons why when I was responding to him, I get so frustrated. All this bloody word salad, yeah? I haven't got time for it, honestly. Yeah. Don't just throw out words that you have no intention on revisiting again. When it comes to the way I express myself in my videos, I do love using high level vocabulary. It's just a form of artistic expression for me. I love languages and the selection of certain vocabulary to carefully craft the way I present information is probably the thing I enjoy the most about making videos on YouTube and by the looks of it, it seems like people enjoy it too. And besides the King's monologue, you use high level complicated vocabulary yourself. Check this out the phenotypic and genotypic diversity or the semantic shift isn't it anthropological and paleopathological analysis of the basal epithelial cells were packed phenotypic and genotypic diversity paleopathological analysis semantic shift it appears to be a double standard when you do it it's fine when i do it it's a word salad just trying to sound smart uh, yeah I, I can't take it honestly all that word salad stuff's like dude just just speak you're not sounding any smarter by unfair and to be clear, I think you should keep doing it. I think it sounds great and it makes your video sound more professional. Just for clarity. All of your arguments will need to be ontological. What? What was ontological about any of the responses that he made? Because I find it bizarre. <laughs> he didn't touch on ontology at all. As far as I saw, there's no aspects of ontology brought into it. But yeah, he's... I think he knows the meaning of the you words. <laughs> This problem you have with my usage of the word ontological surprises me, also because I think you gave an incorrect definition, which is probably the reason why you don't think there is anything ontological in my original response, even though there absolutely is. Ontology is just basically the study of the supernatural, the spiritual, metaphor. I mean, it's so far from anything he raised in this. Ontological has two different meanings and two ways of being used. The first one is the philosophical one. That's not the way I'm using it. I'm using it in the second, non-philosophical usage of the word. Outside of philosophy, ontology is used in a different, more narrow meaning. An ontology is the description of what exists specifically within a determined field. For example, every part that exists in a specific information system. And this includes the relationships and hierarchy between these parts. Unlike philosophers, researchers that approach something in an ontological way, they are focused on naming parts and processes and grouping similar ones together into categories. And this is how you use it, for example, in social ontology. The purpose is to understand and describe the underlying structure structures and relationships between the categories that you define. And this explanation doesn't come from me, but I was paraphrasing the explanation given by Kent Lofgren, PhD and lecturer at the University of Sweden. Link in the description to confirm. All in all, this is me, this is who I am, and that's how I like to speak. After all, this is still you, Tube. I think a lot of my people on my <laughs> channel don't know that you found something out recently that actually was like whoa but where he got the where he got all of his info from oh oh, oh that one is 
Interesting. Someone hit me up with a link. But some blog post about ancient Egypt not being black and they... The blog post he's yeah. talking about is a, a blog called Matilda's blog. It's been around for a long time. And she presented a list of quotes, the same sequence on her blog post is the same sequence you find in Metatron's post. <laughs> she will see it. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So he you basically, he the live. word for word copied his arguments Word. for you from matilda's blog so his research which allegedly where he allegedly formed a team of skilled scholars and astronauts and metaphysicists with a doctorate level response was going online to reddit finding matilda's blog and then it's basically so it's rehashing it. all so of our arguments it. word for word that's hilarious <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> So this is the part where we enter the accusation of plagiarism. What they are stating is that when we say that we did research and examined passages and translated ancient Greek, in reality that never happened. And what they say we did is that we found this Matilda's blog and copied word by word. Remember this. And they say this as if it's a fact, even though they have no evidence. How do I know they have no evidence? Because there can be no evidence. Because we didn't. We as a team were not even aware of the existence of this blog until they mentioned it. I didn't use it. No one in my team used it. This is false. On a positive note, since to try and be as fair as possible, I also have to say that I appreciate the fact that first, it is in fact the King's monologue that provided me with the link to this blog because I couldn't even find it. And second, he did believe me when I said that we did not use it. So I do appreciate that. But I think the part that annoys me the most is that they inflated the claim. Well, actually, scratch that. The part that annoyed me the most is this. So was it, is, is Matilda Metatron's mom? <laughs> <laughs> but the other part that also annoyed me is that they inflated the claim. They say, word by word, copied in the same order. And that, of course, makes it sound like, okay, this is too big of a coincidence. But that's not what happened. Only a few passages that we used were also present on the blog. Moreover, three of these passages, three, are in the exact same order. Now, you call that a massive coincidence? I don't think it's that big of a coincidence because you don't have that many passages specifically from the Greeks and the Romans that talk about the ancient Egyptians look. So it is only natural to converge into the same point and I'm happy to put it through an anti-plagiarism software if that's what it takes. Once again, what's missing here is the concept of plausible deniability. We did not use it. Okay, so straight away he's gone for this very, very poor reproduction of Tomb of Seti I. The total mockery, if you look at the original, it looks nothing like that. Okay, nothing like that. So this is just a myth, all right? This myth of kind of like Tomb of Seti, this is people going in and basically trying to back apply European presence into ancient Egypt, even if, they, if it doesn't show them as the ancient Egyptians. This is not real. This is not real. So we can't give a qualitative discussion based on this image that you've kind of like just 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 picked over here now i understand why you would choose not to use this image in your videos king's monologue but i do not understand why you'd be this categorical about it going as far as saying it's unforgivable to use it now you justify this by calling it a fake but it's an interpretation that's what it is a drawing based on a real ancient egyptian wall art found on the tomb of seti the first just like this this and this are all interpretations and we all use them on videos to show what, for example, the ancient Roman statues and temples actually looked like in period. It is an approximate reconstruction based on pigment examination and literary evidence. Reproductions of all kind are constantly used within any given educational framework. Now, of course, you are more than free to say on your channel that you do not believe this reconstruction to be accurate and you can defend your point of attack as much as you want, but the burden of proof is on you. 
The reason why I say that is because Minutoli, who considered this a fitting reconstruction of the original art, was an archaeologist. He was appointed a member of the Academy of the Sciences. Moreover, he was an eyewitness of this wall in the tomb of Seti I, two centuries ago. Therefore, it's not so far-fetched to think that perhaps he had a better perspective than we do due to a possibly better state of preservation of the wall 200 years ago. We don't have access to that anymore. And I'm not basing this on just temporal speculation, but I justify it based on something that happened in the 19th century. And this information can also be found on pro-Black Egypt Reddit pages, in case you don't believe me. The practice of wet paper for tourism. Which is why I'm inclined to believe an eyewitness when he tells me that this is a good representation of what the wall was showing. Talking about colours, I found a study from the University of Florence specifically dedicated to the tomb of Seti I and colour alteration with time. Link in the description. Now there are several ways to see how colour would have most likely looked like in period. The study in question uses image spectroscopy and mapping techniques for non-inclusive analysis of the paintings in the tomb, including photo-induced luminescent digital imaging. And the results of this study show that there are plenty of images where the colours have darkened and used to be lighter in their original state. Once again, link in the description. So you are correct in saying that some colours do fade with time, but it isn't as cut and dry as you make it sound. Sometimes they fade, sometimes they darken. And that's factual. Is this the best image I could have used? No. Should I have showed it together with the original, maybe right next to it, for context? Sure, I'll give you that. But I do not believe this is invalid. I do trust Minutoli's expertise and direct experience. But let's examine it further. The image, as we can see, represents four different people. Nubians, Egyptians, Libyans and Asiatics. Now, when it comes to the Nubian, apart from the profile, which, as you point out, isn't the most skillful depiction, I mean, the ancient Egyptian did a better job, but he didn't make him white. So I find that sufficient for me, since that's what we are talking about. It's accurate. Now, the Libyan is where we strongly disagree. You say this. <laughs> Let me tell you something for free. Libyans did not have this complexion, okay? This pale white is a complete invention and a complete myth. So here's the original image it was taken from. Yeah, so you'll notice the washed out skin tones there. The place where they have these depictions of these two white skinned Libyans, you, you can see this looks nothing like. The Libyans that we find on the left of the recreation picture is not a representation of what we see on the left of the Nubian on the wall, like the King's monologue is saying here, but it's actually found on the right of the wall. I mean, look, there are no ostrich feathers on top of these people. This is the part where they got the Libyan from that they placed on the left of the reconstruction on the original wall. You'll see that both the leg and the arm on the right are well preserved, even today. You can still see the tattoos. I'm sure you're not trying to tell me that this is the color of a black person, because the color of the skin does look very light, almost European light. And when it comes to the way the Libyans are normally represented in ancient Egyptian art, well, sometimes they are dark skinned, other times they are not. So in this case, of course, Minutoli could have chosen any of these, but I think the fact that he chose the light-skinned version is good, because that's what the wall shows. Now, the Egyptian is the most reconstructed one, because on the wall we only see the feet. But what did Minutoli do to justify this? Well, to me, he looked everywhere else in the tomb and chose the typical reddish-brown hue you normally see the Egyptian represented as. Now, I don't see this as a problem, although then again, you could argue that the tone should have been darker. I'm open to that interpretation, but we also find this color. So once again, to me, this does not make it a fake. The Asiatic is the only one that I have to agree may have been lightened a bit too much, but with that being said, when we say Asiatics in context, we mean Semitic people, usually. So before I can really engage with this one, I need to know what you think ancient Semitic people and people from the Near East, were they supposed to be black? I mean, I don't know, so I'm, I don't want to create a straw man you'll let me know. As I promised on our exchange on Twitter, if you convince me that this is a fake, I'll cut it out from my videos. But as of now, you haven't. And I don't think that calling it a fake or unforgivable based on the fact that you disagree with the interpretation is fair. You just disagree and you think it's inaccurate. That doesn't make it automatically a fake for everyone. And now that I have explained this, I think it's time to discuss Herodotus and the way he described the ancient Egyptians in ancient Greek. 
Most ancient Greek sources do indeed describe the ancient Egyptians as black on multiple occasions. The people living there along the Nile are black because of the heat. So did Herodotus say in his Historia that the ancient Egyptians were black? Well, how about we jump into Greek interlinear and see for ourselves? I will now proceed to give you a full contextual analysis of his words in period. Let's begin with Book 2, verse 12. On this verse, Herodotus uses this word, same stem, same origin, to describe the black soil or the fertile land of Egypt. On verse 22, he then uses this term to describe the people of Egypt, still same stem. So, does this mean black when it's applied to people? The best way to understand what a term can mean from the perspective of an ancient Greek is to see how they use it in a variety of verses. And when we do that, we'll see that all it means is a dark complexion not necessarily black in the black African way. Now, whether I agree with you or not, I do need to underline that the following section that I'm going to play from your video does bring a very strong argument in your favor. You will show that the same term used by these ancient Greek authors is used to describe both the Egyptians and the Nubians. Let's watch it and then I'll respond to that. And Diodora said this about the people he saw. But there are also a great many other tribes of the Ethiopians, some of them dwelling in the land lying on both banks of the Nile and on the islands in the river, others inhabiting the neighboring country of Arabia, and still others residing in the interior of Libya. The majority of them, and especially those who dwell along the river, are black in color and have flat noses and woolly hair. So, the Ethiopians are described with this term in ancient Greek, so are the Egyptians, and since we know that the Ethiopians are black Africans, by extension, so are the Egyptians. Egyptians. It means black. Now, I can respect this point, but I disagree with it strongly. Here is why. I will demonstrate now how this term is used in a huge variety of situations, describing loads of different people. These words are used to describe people from Syria, people from Cyprus, the Colchians from modern-day Georgia. It is later on also used to describe Othello, and it is used also to describe the skin tone of Ulysses. Even though you rejected that, I still think it's very valid. It does not matter there is mythology. It's a term used within a language. I'll get back to that in a minute. Plutarch describes a Syrian mercenary, Diodes, with this term. Syrians are not black Africans. Diogenes uses this term to describe the philosopher Zenon, a native of Cyprus, whom, because of his darker complexion, was nicknamed the Egyptian, from Cyprus. Back to Herodotus, he used the exact same term that he's using to describe the Egyptians to describe another people the Colchians. These are the people that were inhabiting the modern-day Georgia in Caucasus. He, in fact, believes that they must have been related with the Egyptians because they look similar, we read. For it is plain to see that Colchians are Egyptians, and this that I say I myself noted before I heard it from others, partly because they are dark-skinned and curly-haired, though that indeed goes for nothing, seeing that other peoples too are such. But my better proof was that the Colchians and the Egyptians and Ethiopians are the only only nations that have, from the first, practiced circumcision. So he's talking about a people that we would not consider black Africans, and he's using the same term, which is why I prefer to translate it as dark-skinned rather than black. Also note how he describes Colchians, Egyptians and Ethiopians, and as you can see he does use Ethiopians separately from Egyptians even though they had cultural common ground. What this tells me is that if we accept that this term means black in the modern sense, it means that every single one of these people are all black Africans. The way we interpret this, and this includes professional linguists and experienced translators of ancient Greek, is that the term is a lot broader than the modern, politicized, restricted word black, and it includes all sorts of people with all sorts of different degrees of dark skin, which includes black Africans, but also Middle Eastern people, Semitic people, and some Mediterraneans when they tan. And before this gets twisted, I'm not saying the ancient Egyptians were a Mediterranean civilization, I'll get back to that. And our interpretation makes a lot more sense because it isn't based on a modern term and how we modernly expect it to be read or interpreted. We are using and understanding this term in the ancient way. It's similar to how we interpret the word white. The Greeks and the Romans used several terms to describe themselves and these can be translated as white, but that should only 
only be interpreted broadly as people with a lighter skin or low levels of melanin, rather than in the modern sense of Benjamin Franklin used to mean basically only people of certain Germanic groups. I also have this story which sheds light on how the inhabitants of the Delta, which are also Egyptian, were considered. There is a very famous piece of ancient Egyptian literature called the story of Sinuhe. I'm sure these creators are all familiar with this. This is from the Middle Kingdom and it's believed to have been written somewhere between the 12th and the 13th dynasties, as it is widely considered one of the greatest of all Middle Kingdom literary compositions. Of course, this is literature, it's a story, but there is a passage that I think is relevant. So the protagonist is an Egyptian who's gone into exile due to a false accusation and then returns into Egypt as he is trying to convey the absurdity of this entire ordeal he had to go through, he says, It was the manner of a dream, as when a Delta man sees himself in Elephantine, a man of the marshes in Tassetti. Let's examine this very quickly because I think it can be revealing. What this passage seems to convey is the fact that it would be absolutely absurd to think that a man from the Delta area of Egypt would be seen in Elephantine. For context, Elephantine is in Upper Egypt. What this suggests to me is that a man from Delta in Egypt looks differently from a man from Elephantine Egypt. So it does seem to indicate that there is a clear difference between people, Egyptians from Delta and Egyptians from Elephantine. And this would sit well with my interpretation because I do believe that the Egyptians in Upper Egypt had a much higher percentage of black individuals, so would be closer to Ethiopians, than the Egyptians in the Delta region. This, however, would not sit well with your interpretation because if an Ethiopian and an Egyptian are the same, both culturally and phenotypically, then why would it be so absurd as to feel like a dream to imagine an inhabitant of the Delta in Elephantine? What would be so strange about that if they were basically the same people? If all Egyptians were 99% black and if Ethiopians and Egyptians looked the same and were so intricately connected? And the other reason why this is very significant to us as a team, because it also attacks this argument frequently presented by Mr. Rimotep, whereby before the Romans and the Greeks, all Egyptians were black, but after the inclusions of the Greeks and the Romans, that's when the Egyptians start changing as a population because of interbreeding. If that were the case, then a man from Delta and a man from Elephantine should be the exact same from the perspective of this ancient Egyptian from from the Middle Kingdom. This is how I defend my usage of the word olive skin, because even when we look at Herodotus, which is the first one you quote to demonstrate that the ancient Egyptians were black, well he used the same term to describe people of the Near East. Hence my choice to use olive skin, because it includes people from the Near East and people from Africa, depending on the hue. What you are doing instead, by using a politicized term, black, you are specifically trying to encapsulate the words of the ancient and read them in a modern sense. And when I talk about tan, it's because we do have examples in which sometimes this word is also used, again it's polysemic, to mean a tan. For example, the case in Ulysses, when I read that story about Athena, which for some reasons you rejected because it's mythology, but then again that's very strange that you would do that, since all I was doing by utilizing words used in mythology is cross-disciplinary examination. Nothing wrong. Standard practice in academia when you're trying to contextualize a word and you need more examples. It doesn't matter that it's used in mythology. It's still a word in their vocabulary and we can see how they use it and learn from it from a linguistic standpoint. So, were the ancient Egyptians white? No. These passages just debunk that. You're welcome. But there is a connection with Semitic and Asiatic people. You can of course decide to disagree, but at least you can see where I'm coming from and classifying these opinions that we form based on how we read the classics as lies is not fitting. My point of contention, again, was that the multi-ethnic argument makes it sound like all ethnicities that were there at some point contributed equally to the foundation of the civilization. That's simply not the case. By this logic, Metatron should have no problem calling ancient Rome a multi-ethnic civilization, since it was present in Africa and Asia too, and that many people of different ethnicities were part of the Great Roman Empire. But were they equal to the people from Southern Europe who founded the civilization? 
No. So Rome should be classified as another multi-ethnic civilization and no one in particular should claim it. Or at least Africa, Asia and Europe together should claim the creation and development of the Roman civilization. But we all know this does not stand because the ones who built the foundational elements that made that civilization what it was and were the primary group to have unified the other ethnicities under their empire was a southern European ethnic group. And Metatron, you make videos where you are not okay with Europeans trying to over highlight the multi the ethnic side of ancient Rome. In those analyses, you look at the foundational population to back your argument, but for ancient Egypt, you don't do so. But I am not one to ignore that. I do not think this example fits, because in order to fit, the parameters need to be similar. You're removing a very important factor from this equation, time. Let's go 5,000 years in the future, the year is 7,024, assuming that we are still around as a species and we don't have technology so advanced that we would know everything about the past, and then we talk about whether they think America was multi-ethnic in its foundation or not. A much more complicated task. The reason why now it's very clear who founded America uh, is because it's very recent. So you can't put this question in the same spectrum as who founded ancient Egypt, which occurred 5,000 years ago. It is the very fact that we are speaking about something that happened so long ago that makes answering this question very tricky and multi-layered. It's complicated. So you seem to want to prove that there is a double standard at play because I'm not saying that America is multi-ethnic in its foundation or that Rome was multi-ethnic in its foundation, but I do it with ancient Egypt. Yet even in the case of Rome, the situation is much more documented and it's much more recent. There is in fact a massive difference between when Rome was founded and when ancient Egypt was founded. When it comes to time frame, and you of course know that. In other words, apples and pears. Now before I continue talking and addressing all of your points, including the Nakata culture and a few other linguistic aspects like the Afroasiatic origins, before I do that, I think what we have in front of us now is two options. One, we continue making videos where we attack each other's credibility and we continue the drama. This is option one. I prefer option two. And when I say this, I'm going against my own interests. Because if we continue the drama, I'm the one who benefits the most. Let me prove it using your own words. That's why it was like, my video is like 24,000 views. His video in like a week, 400,000. Yeah. So he knows, he knows the numbers game. It's like, oh, my video is going to be more credible because I got the numbers. YouTube is going to suggest it more because I got the numbers and his video is just going to be there. For me instead, I'm the one who gets more views. My average watch time on that video response is extremely high and I gained 20,000 subscribers from these two videos alone, together with 1.5 million views. And I'm not saying this to flex, I'm saying it so that you will believe me that I'm once again in good faith when I say, if we continue the drama, it's good for me. But I'm not here for the views, I'm not here for the drama, I'm here for the truth and for the benefit of my audience and why not, by extension, yours. So let me tell you what option two is. Here's what I offer. Option two. We ditch the liar, manipulator drama and we instead, behind the scenes, on neutral ground, try to find what points in common we have. Think about it. You say I lie and you have the truth and your subscribers believe you. My subscribers don't. No change. Vice versa. I say you lie and I have the truth. Your subscribers don't believe me. Mine do. No change. That's because people want to look at facts through the prism of what they already believe. But what happens if we find areas where we agree on? But considering where we stand, whoever ends up watching those videos, whether it be from your community or mine, will know, oh well, if they agree on this one, it must be true. Imagine the potential from an educational perspective, and it would be a great way to set an example, as we, as creators, look beyond our own personal interests and monetary gains and look out for the benefit of our audiences. We put them first. To give you an example of what that would look like, was the Sahara Desert a barrier? You know that some of the people that attack the idea of a black Egypt use this as an attack against you. And then you, generally speaking people who believe in the black Egypt theory, show evidence to demonstrate that the Sahara was not, in fact, a barrier. Well, we agree with that 100% as a full team. The Sahara Desert was not a barrier. And we can prove it 
with passages, for example this one, to the interior of Africa in a southern direction beyond the Gaetuli. After having traversed the intervening deserts, we shall find, first of all, the Libby Egyptians, and then the country where the Luca Ethiopians dwell. That was Pliny. And there are many other passages to demonstrate that. Now imagine if we could sit down and find 10, 15 points, like, oh yeah, we agree, we both agree that this specific pharaoh was indeed black, or we agree on this other point. All of this with the common goal of creating an ethos of open source and transparency for people to access. The views we all collectively gain when discussing these topics clearly indicate an increased interest in empirically grounded research on this topic. There are a few things that I need to clarify when it comes to my original statement, when it comes to ancient Egyptian belonging to the Afroasiatic subgroup, and then all the following discussions that came from that. First of all, I don't understand why you think Hamito-Semitic is a racist term. When I discussed ancient Egyptian as a language, I said it was Afroasiatic, and I also used the term Hamito-Semitic. Although I think I did mispronounce it on that video and I said Hamito-Semitic with a K, that's because that's how we say it in Italian, by the way. With that being said, one of your points of accusation is the fact that Hamito-Semitic is a racist term, and you motivated that with this guy being offended by it because it has religious connotations, I suppose. Hamito-Semitic, it is absolutely still in use in mainstream and highest level academia, as you can see here. The term is also still being used by some of the highest and most respected Egyptologist uh, in academia, for example, the main professor at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. And just because you found this scholar who is offended by it and thinks that it's racist and also doesn't like the religious connotation of it, it doesn't mean that now no one can use it, otherwise we will all be accused of being racists. And I'm not willing to concede you that, but even if the term was racist, well I wasn't using it with that intent. And I think what a person really thinks and their true intent and their true heart is the most important thing, rather than, oh, this is a term, some people are offended by it, maybe it's racist. I didn't mean it in any racist way. In the same way, then Christians should be offended by the words Wednesday and Thursday because they are connected to pagan gods, such as Woden, so Odin and Thor. Should we all be offended whenever a term has religious connotation? But there are a lot of terms that have connotations to religions and belief systems that the people that use these terms don't believe in. Not to mention, if Hamito-Semitic indeed was a racist term, then one of the most prestigious Western publication companies Brill is racist. Look at it this way. It would be like me accusing you of being racist towards Asian people because you use the word oriental. Well, that word in English is actually frowned upon. Thing is, though, that I wouldn't do that because, for example, in Italian, orientale has zero racial connotation and it's used in the highest ends of academia. So to me, when you use the word oriental, nah, there's nothing racist about that, it's cool. And the same way, this could be a situation whereby maybe in Italian we use camito semitic, camito semita, camito, camito semitic in a way that we don't feel there is anything racist, but maybe there is in English, I'm willing to listen to that. That's what you guys tell me, I'll stop using it in English, just like I don't use the word oriental anymore, but I do use it in Italian. But these words are different. An obvious example would be the way to say black in Spanish, which of course I'm not gonna say for obvious reasons, but in Spanish that's the way you say it. So I ask you to have an open mind with the fact that I'm not a native English speaker. Whether ancient Egyptian as a language originated in Africa, or as you say in the Horn of Africa, or in general coming from the south, or whether it originated from the Near East in connection with Semitic languages is still a debated topic. So I do have to underline for clarity, then there are scholars that believe one way and scholars that defend the others. So basically what Mr. Imhotep, Quilimica, uh, the King's Monologue present or bring forth. So they do have scholars that agree with them. This is not just, oh, Afrocentrists believe that. No, this is something that has actually got some strength in academic discourse. But the part that I didn't like is how you twisted it. So you're trying to prove that Afroasiatic languages are mostly African and only the Semitic branch, so only one among so many languages is believed to have originated outside of Africa. And when you say it that way, it makes it sound that, yeah, so the majority of speakers of these Afroasiatic languages speak languages that originated in Africa and only a little minority 
the Semitic branch speaks languages that haven't originated in Africa. But the reality is that the Semitic branch alone has an enormous number of speakers, which is why I believe it is absolutely pertinent to call it Afro-Asiatic. And I don't have a problem with Afro being at the beginning and Asiatic being latter, because yes, the majority of these languages do originate in Africa, so put Africa first. But the Semitic branch, you really underplayed it in the way you explained this. You do need to put into context the fact that the Semitic branch alone has an enormous number of speakers and the languages have a massive importance within the subgroup. One of the main arguments presented by those who support the idea of ancient Egyptian being very well connected to the Semitic branch are the people that present all of the different lexical similarities and underline a possible connection or tether between ancient Egyptian and the Semitic language branch. But then again, there are also several several scholars that are well respected that say no, the tether or the connection between two, these two languages is not strong enough for us to present this idea that ancient Egyptian was in fact Semitic and they do believe that the language originated in Africa. So when it comes to this, I am willing to explore this more in depth, but I do need support from the Egyptologist in my team and we are working on this, so a full on dedicated video to the ancient Egyptian language to really explore its roots and present both arguments and then let the audience make their mind. So I'll get back to you on this one. Now, in general terms, I agree that the Nakada culture is distinctly Egyptian and there is a strong connection between the very beginning of Egypt and Nakada. But to you, the Nakada culture is 100% a black African culture, and yet there are some archaeological pieces of evidence that seem to point towards a different direction. So let me show you those. While it is important for me to say that there are indeed scholars that agree with this take of the Africanity of the Nakada culture, it is also important to say that there are scholars who strongly disagree. Scholars believe that the Nakada culture was born in Upper Egypt in the Chalcolithic period, but its phenotypic traits are as difficult to define as those of the ancient Egyptian. From the American journal Physical Anthropology, we read, The pre-dynastic of Upper Egypt and the late dynastic of Lower Egypt are more closely related to each other than any other population. As a whole, they show ties with the European Neolithic, North Africa, modern Europe, and, more remotely, India, but not at all with Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Asia, Oceania, or the New World. I am reading from the journal to present you a countering perspective, but I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with this, because what I think is that there absolutely is also an African component within the early Egyptian culture in connection with the Nakada culture. But there is something else they say that it's interesting. Check this out. Adjacent people in the Nile Valley show similarities in trivial traits in an unbroken series from the Delta in the north, southward through Nubia, and all the way to Somalia and the Equator. At the same time, the gradient in skin color and body proportion suggests long-term adaptive response to selective forces appropriate to the latitude when they occur. An assessment of race is as useless as it is impossible. Neither clients nor clusters alone suffice to deal with the biological nature of a widely distributed population. Both must be used. We conclude that the Egyptians have been in place since back in the Pleistocene and have been largely unaffected by either invasions or migrations. As others have noted, Egyptians are Egyptians, and they were so in the past as well. So there are two things we can take from this reading that I agree with. The first one is that I do not believe that the original populations of Egypt were so affected by invasions, whether it be the Romans, whether it be the Greeks, or whether it be the Arabs, as to have been completely ethnically replaced. And second, it's really difficult to just use cranial or bone examination and just say, yeah, they were all black, they were all white, they were all olive skin, Middle East and what have you. Besides, when we look at the archaeological evidence, in my opinion, it becomes more difficult to categorically state that Nakada culture definitely derives from the south, independently from a possible ethnic connection with the Nubians. Nakada people from the chiefdom, Atiera Konpolis, conducted a violent expansion into Lower Nubia in the mid-fourth millennium BC. The violent encounters with the natives are testified through evidence of interpersonal violence in five cemeteries of the predecessors of the A group people, young males buried with weapons in a Nakada cemetery in A-group territory and a settlement pattern shifting southward. And this kind of violent confrontation, which is backed by archaeology, seems to suggest that the ancient Nakada culture, which was uh, created and originated in Upper Egypt, was in fact distinct from the Nubian Group A culture. 
they fought. Still from the American Journal of Physical Archaeology we read, the Ethiopian element present in the crania in connection to the Nakada culture is absolutely a real thing, but it doesn't characterize in a univocous way the ethnicity phenotype of the culture and above all its variation which show, just like the previous Badarian culture, important influxes from the Near East on a genetic basis. So what this shows is that we are in front of a continuous superimposition of different ethnic groups throughout the history of Egyptian culture, including the possibility of the Natufiana culture from the Near East, which brought farming and left a genetic trace. This is why, to me, the idea that elements of the Nakada culture having conquered had imposed themselves as a ruling class in Egypt is too simplistic of a vision, and the most recent analyses opt for a much more articulated picture with a long process of cultural exchange, violence between Upper and Lower Egypt. In particular, imagining the Nakada culture as being entirely an emission from further south contradicts the archaeological evidence independently from a possible ethnic connection with the Nubians. The violent encounters with the natives are testified through evidence of interpersonal violence in five cemeteries of the predecessor of the A group people. Another interesting piece of connection between the Near East and ancient Egyptian culture, including the Nakada culture, is that when we look at this statue from the Nakada culture, we see that it's very similar to this Sumerian statue and the statue of this Badarian culture and this Badarian statue. Similarly, we can testify to this influx of cultural elements from the Near East, which intensify, particularly during the Nakta II or Gerze culture. If the Near East element is a lie created and fabricated by the West, then how do you explain these similarities? As a demonstration of this slow but constant migration of Near Eastern elements throughout the entire history of Egypt. We see the DNA analysis of Egyptian mummies at Abu Sir el-Melek includes specimens starting from the New Kingdom, which show an affinity with the genetic heritage of the Near East of Neolithic and Bronze Age cultures. And what I just said was from the University of Cambridge. Why should I not believe them? Why should I think that the University of Cambridge is lying? Still, when it comes to DNA analysis and what it proves, I can read what they say, but I'm not an expert. And as far as I understand, neither of you. The University of Cambridge says this, usually you tend to debunk these DNA tests when they present mummies that seem to be connected to the Near East or even Southern Europeans. But you do push forward these studies about melanin quantities within to over 200 mummies that I think King's monologue was kind enough to share with me. So what I decided to do is that I'm going to come back to this DNA section, but after having had someone in my team, so adding a genetist to my team, so we can have a look at these from the perspective of a professional. Because I found these studies on the melanin contents on these mummies that King's monologue sent to me extremely interesting. I've been watching this video. Hopefully I'll be able to have access to the studies proper rather than a video talking about the studies because that's the way you do it. I couldn't really find the study proper, so it would be great if you could give it to me. Then I will readdress this whole DNA part with, again, as I say, a professional. We'll look into it and we will discuss this more deeply, but on a dedicated video. Metatron, our king of rigor and goodwill, spends his time acting like the Delta or Mediterranean region of Egypt is the most relevant part of that country, while the South is the land of the inferior blacks. So, the ethnic or true Egyptians are the southerners that Metatron seems to look down on because they were black. It's the audacity, isn't it? How dare you, yeah. how dare you, African, question me, bro. how dare you, African, challenge my Eurocentric knowledge? Okay, so this is a very serious accusation. So I would like to ask a favor to my black subscribers and supporters, because I know you are there in the thousands, if not tens of thousands. I see you in the comments all the time. Do you feel that these two statements pushed forward by Mr. Imhotep represent accurately the way you think I feel about my black subscribers. If anything, the reason why I keep talking about African history, even though people wouldn't want me to, is because I also have black subscribers that do want me to keep going, and therefore I will. And even though you can disagree with everything I say at a scholarly level, I don't think it's correct to try and insinuate or put into people's minds the idea that I have some sort of racist approach to this. That is really out of place. There is zero racism in my mind. Zero. Because as a religious and Christian man, we're all children of God. Well, I saw his response to um, another big YouTube channel. It wasn't the same energy. He was very cool, calm, 
uh just like yeah this guy i'm having a conversation here but this with me mm-hmm. was like man you're gonna get it i'm gonna show you that i'm Okay, this is a very valid point of critique because Quelimica has rightly noted that even though usually when I make response videos to other channels, I tend to be milder, whereas in my response video to him, I was somewhat passive-aggressive. Even though then again, I showed respect, it's just that you guys cut out every single section where I did show respect, at least Mr. Imhotep did. Well, you guys watched it, but you didn't believe it. I don't say it's 100% true because, for example, on this video, I go even harsher when I respond to a specific channel in there feel free to check it. So, to you, I kind of used a mid-range tier. I didn't go super soft, but I didn't go full force. Regardless, why did I choose to not be, like, nice? And why was there a certain smug tone in some of my uh, responses to you? Well, I hope that you'll be able to see where I'm coming from here, because after you made your initial video response, as I say, I got flooded by people saying this, which already didn't really put me in the best state of mind, but then the King's Monologue started responding, and as I started looking at you all as a community, so you, the King's Monologue, Mr. Imhotep, what I noticed in that there seems to be a common anti-European sentiment, and I am from... Now, I have to say that of all the people and of all the creators in this community, Quelimica tends to be one of the mildest ones. So probably my response should have been softer, specifically because he's not as aggressive towards Europe as, for example, Mr. Imhotep seems to be. So I'll admit fault in that. With that being said, though, can you really blame me as a European man when I see statements like this that I will be somewhat defensive when I approach a discussion or a debate with your community. How would you react to a community that tends to do that? And I'm asking you to be honest in this. Because in my almost 1000 videos, I have never said one negative word about Africans or black people. Never. You can watch all of my videos, you'll never find one. But whenever I click and I check these videos, what I see is oh, Europeans lie, the West is lying to you, that's what Europeans do, they steal. And I think that's really out of place, particularly if we want to create any sort of interesting debate. But if you don't want me to be defensive and you want us to take you seriously with the kind of research that you bring forth, which I'm more than happy to do, I think this whole anti European sentiment should be dialed down because that does not show. An open mind in your regard. Also because I really need you to help me understand this. What does a freaking Dutch farmer in 2024 who is working the land to feed his family or a student in Portugal or a Scottish guy in a pub have to do with British colonialists several centuries ago and what they did in Africa. So I do want to put myself in your shoes if you want to condemn and attack colonialism and you know the tens of thousands of artifacts that they stole from African people and still show in their museums, do that. But there is no reason to say Europeans lie because then you are taking innocent people, me included, that have nothing to do with what happened centuries ago and you're still holding us accountable and saying that what we do is stole and lie. What the heck do I have to do or we modern Europeans have to do with what some colonialists did? You should be angry at the governments or the people in power at that time. And considering the fact that, for example, the King's monologue said that I shouldn't put all black people in one bucket, I agree with you, but then you should also not put all white people or all white Europeans in one bucket because a French, a Portuguese, an Italian, a Spanish, an English, a Dutch, and I can keep on stating nationalities, we are not all the same. When you say that all of us are liars just because we have light skin, then I'm gonna have a problem with that. And I think you see where I'm coming from. And that's what your community looks like from the outside. Now, you do whatever you want. If you take a moment because of this video and you think, yeah, you know, I think he has a good point. Let's bolster and present the positive aspects of Africa and let that speak on its own rather than trying to continuously condemn modern Europeans and modern people due to their white skin. And let's drop that negative aspect. Then I think you would benefit enormously in public opinion. But if you don't want to do that, which is perfectly your choice, of course, freedom of speech after all, then don't be surprised if then people either of a European descent or a 100% European like me will look at what you present and have a preconceived negative mindset. 
what did you expect? So do you see where I was coming from when I made my original response video? It seems like from all the people of these regions, only the Egyptians are pale skinned with a permanent tan. The others are just depicted white or yellow olive, despite the fact that they tan too. Does it mean that the Egyptians love to depict themselves tanned and never with their natural light olive complexions, while they always depicted the others pale without tan despite living under the same sun? Because if we say that they were tanned, it means that their complexion is not their natural complexion. Actually, Mr. Imhotep made a very good point here. I have to admit that even though I hate the rest of his video. But this is a good point when he's combating this idea that I was presenting whereby the entered Egyptian color we see could be the result of a tan. So now he kind of convinced me that it's more possible that that is their original color, not a tan. And because of this, I will now explore this possibility with a different mindset. Thanks for this one. But following Metatron's weak logic, skin color defines ethnicity and Egyptians were the light-skinned people while all people living in the south that he called the blacks were darker than the Egyptians. Egyptians that he called the light-skinned people like the mysterious ancient northern Indians, by the way. Thus making it impossible for the Egyptians to belong to the black ethnic group since the colors are not the same. Just with these very basic visuals, I completely annihilated Metatron's entire video. Yeah, no, this one is very weak instead. You didn't disprove anything, because my point was never to try and exclude black people from being Egyptians. I have said that a percentage of Egyptians would have been black. So when you show me a statue that looks black, and you tell me, ah, you see, that's an Egyptian, it doesn't disprove anything, because I recognize that some Egyptians were black. So no, you didn't disprove anything there. You disproved a straw man. Here is another image of jet black Egyptians with light brown Egyptians. They will say the jet black ones are just Nubians living in Egypt as always and then this other image this is from the tomb of Oremeb I believe and the men and the women the, both the servants are depicted with this brown they'll skin. say the jet black ones are just Nubians living in Egypt this is another straw man I didn't say that and I wouldn't say that because when I say it's multi-ethnic I include black people in there so if you show me a very like jet black or even just a black individual. I wouldn't tell you, oh, then that cannot be an Egyptian that has to be a Nubian. I don't say that. So this is a straw man. I'll tell you absolutely, black Egyptians also existed. There's more to consider, though. The mosaic of Palestrina, created around 100 BC, depicts Egypt under Greek rule during Strabo's lifetime and predates the other European scholars mentioned by Metatron. This artwork displays a population in Egypt greatly affected by foreign invasions. The northern part portrays a mix of foreigners who are also Egyptian by nationality since they lived there. In the south, we find the native Egyptians who closely resemble indigenous Africans and are akin to the Nubians. This mosaic, crafted by European artists during the Ptolemaic period, sheds light on the possibility that the scholars were describing this mixture of foreigners in the northern part of Egypt. Whenever you show me an ancient Egyptian that looks black, I'll tell you, okay, that fits within my multi-ethnic position. And of course, if you happen to be able to show me so much art from a specific period, and you show me, look, in this period, 80%, 70% of the art looks very dark-skinned individuals, and then we examine the pigments, and we're like, yeah, this is actually, this is real. A lot of more people were black in this specific dynasty or in this specific section of Egypt, then I'll be more than happy to readjust my percentages, but it's still multi-ethnic for me, until you can prove the 99%, like Mr. Imhotep puts it, of all Egyptians were black throughout the entirety of ancient Egyptian history, all the way up to the Romans and the Greeks arriving, which is a very hard thing to defend, because all I need is to find one pharaoh, and be like, okay, this guy, genetic testing, he was not black, and that's already a problem. Which is why I think sometimes you attack so vehemently any proof or any archaeological piece of evidence that shows a significant contribution from the Near East. Because in by doing so, that's a problem, because if it becomes 95%, if it becomes 91%, that it's not all black, which is the position that I believe you're trying to defend. Much harder. With that being said, I agree with the King's monologue when he says, let's test the mummies. Absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, if I was in power, what I would do right now would be take every single mummy that we have, test them all. Test every single mummy we find. That's the part that I agree with him. Let's test it all. But all in all, as I was saying, I think it would be very beneficial 
If we take, for example, every single pharaoh and you show me all the evidence that demonstrates for you that those are all black, and then I'll put it to the test with the evidence that shows the opposite. And then with my team, we can review that and say, hey, we agree on pharaoh 3, 7, 8, and 9. These were definitely black, but when it comes to these others, we don't. But at least the ones we agree with, then our communities will be like, yes, if they agree with this, then they must be true. Mm -hmm. So when it talks to when it and people were very and people in the ancient world were never described by the color of their hair. That is not a trend, okay? And I will challenge Metatron on that. Even in ancient even in ancient Greece, they were never describe people using the color of their hair. They won't say, "Oh, he's a blonde." That's the modern thing. That's about 150 years old. But people say, "He's a blonde. Mm -hmm. He's a brunette. He's a this. He's a that." They wouldn't do that. I accept your challenge, and we are very confident about that one, just so you know, for another video. Metatron offers a definition of the term Ethiopian, and I find myself in partial agreement with his interpretation. This aligns with what I've consistently maintained. To the ancient Greeks, Ethiopians referred to black people or black Africans in general. According to Metatron's own assertions, this term referred to a particular phenotype rather than denoting a specific geographical region. Yep. We agree on that one. Passage comes from Astronomica, written by Manilius. It's important to note that the Astronomica was composed around 30 to 40 AD during the Roman Byzantine period. 30 AD is not the Byzantine Roman period, it's the Principate. It is such a basic mistake that I'm just gonna say you probably got tired while you were editing the video and you misspoke. On the other hand, just to show you that this is not just me trying to bash, this is a post that I agree with made by Mr. Rimotep is lamenting the fact that why do you not have black actors playing ancient Egyptians? And I agree with him. There should absolutely be at least some black actors playing the role of ancient Egyptians and they would be more fitting than, for example, someone from Denmark, just to say one. I do agree with him on that. Although, of course, the part we disagree with is that for him, they should all be black. Whereas for me, you should just remove the white unless you're doing Ptolemy and show brown and black, including people from the Levant. Anyhow, this was a very long video, of course, and I wish to thank everyone who has spent so much of their time to watch this, listen to me ramble for a very long time and dive into this discussion. I do believe that there is good in all these creators that have responded to me. I do not consider them as my enemies and I'm more than happy to be open-minded and look into the evidence they present, including these studies on melanin contents in the mummies, because if you review all evidence, then you will be a higher chance to find the truth, which ultimately is only one.